Good morning. My name's Jeff, and uh, I'm your worship leader here. And if you're worshiping online, or if you're here with us, it's good to see everyone with us this morning. And it's good to have you all online as well. Um, there are four ways to check in now. Um, you can check in on our app. You can bookmark it in, in the pews. And <laughs> the hub. Um, and, or scan the QR code. Um, but we're really glad you're worshiping with us. And let's all stand and sing together.
morning. I'm Jen, one of the pastors here this morning. Actually, I'm the only pastor here this morning. <laughs> Matt and Beth are out gallivanting. Uh, can we go to God in prayer, please? Gracious and loving God, we pray that the words of our lips and the meditation of our hearts may be pleasing to you this morning. When we think of the glories of your salvation, the excellencies of your perfection, and the unchanging faithfulness of your promise to us, we praise your name forever and ever. Lord, we pray this for those in our communities as well, that they experience your perfection, your salvation, and your faithfulness, that they feel the love you give and the offer, the offer of new creation. Lord, we ask that you be with us and those on the margins, those who are struggling, who are ill, who are having a hard time finding the light, your light, Lord. Lord, we lift up those troubles and joys or concerns that are on our hearts this morning. We know that you will, you will surround us with your comforting and loving arms. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So I have mentioned before, but for anyone that maybe has missed a sermon or two, uh, I am happiest when I'm out, outdoors. Give me a camp chair, a book, and a hammock, and I will literally spend the entire day outside. I love the feel of the warmth on my face. I love the feel of the wind in my hair, and lately we've had a lot of wind. I love the sound of the water chirping of the birds, the butterflies, the lightning bugs, the caterpillars, animals, all the creatures. But the outdoors has not always loved me. First, the sun tries to kill me. I have lupus, and with that sometimes causes this uh, photosensitivity, so I end up having to cover from head to toe when I go outside. I literally get hives if I stay out in direct sunlight for very long. And if a mosquito bites me, I'm done for. <laughs> it swells up and I'm taking Benadryl. And uh, I have some allergies is what I'm saying. And I can't tell you how many times I've bitten, end up bitten by spiders and ended up in urgent care. Or caterpillars who sting. Did you know that caterpillars can sting? I didn't either until I was stung by one by a bright neon green caterpillar, and I ended up in urgent care again. And apparently I didn't learn my lesson because I've been stung no less than probably five different times by five different caterpillars. Clearly God wanted to remind me of my place in God's beautiful and amazing creation and realize that humanity is a part of an interdependent with the rest of God's created universe. And also that a caterpillar could end my life. Today's scripture lands us in Psalms 104, 5 through 24. And the Psalms, they're 150 ancient Hebrew poem songs and prayers. And they come from different periods in Israel's history. And many of these poems are connected to King David, 73 of them actually. And he was known as this poet and a harp player. But there were many other authors also involved, and uh, 49 of the 150 are actually poems that are anonymous. Now, many of these poems were used by Israel's temple choirs, but the book of Psalms is not actually a hymn book. In the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient songs were all gathered together with many other Hebrew poems and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms. And the entire work has a unique, and, a unique design and a message that the reader will not notice unless you read it from the beginning to the end. So the key themes we see in the book of Psalms is God as king of all of creation, which is kind of what we've been focusing on, hope for the Messiah after exile, and lament as a response to evil. Now the book of Psalms is divided into five books with chapters 1 through 2 serving as kind of an introduction, and the rest of the psalms are arranged um, accordingly. So today we're focusing on book 4, which is where Psalm 104, 5 through 24, hear these words. He set the earth 
on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled at the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross, never again if they will cover the earth. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that be planted. There the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the junipers. The high mountains belong to the wild goats, and the crags are a refuge for the hyrax. He made the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then people go out to their work, to their labor until evening. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Now, book four is designed to respond to this crisis. This crisis actually happens in book three. The poet remembers how God said God would never abandon the line of David. But how does that promise then align with Jerusalem's destruction and the downfall of David's line? And the poem concludes in book three by asking God to remember the covenant. Remember the covenant with David and to, and to forgive God's people. And book four actually contains verses 90 through 106. And in the opening of book four, we return to Israel's roots with this prayer to Moses. Describing his pleas for God's mercy after the golden calf incident. And the center of, book is dom center of book four is dominated by a group of players that announce that the Lord, God of Israel, is the tr true king of creation, which is where we are today in our scripture. The trees, the mountains, the rivers, they're all summoned to celebrate this future day when God will bring God's healing justice and kingdom all over the world. And in Psalm 104, the world that God creates and recreates is not just ordered, but rhythmic. And each created thing, a note that contributes to the Spirit's song. The whole of creation is like a song of joy sung by the Spirit of the Lord. And when you're looking at the whole of Psalm 104, it helps us to see more deeply the significance of the portion of the text that we're using today. The psalm begins with this hymn of praise for the glory of the creator. It says, clothed with splendor and majesty and wrapped in light. And that glory is manifest in the, ma in the manifold works of creation, in the rhythmic ordering of the world and, and all of its parts. That ensuing song of creation closely, although not slavishly, follows this cadence of creation that we found in the narrative of Genesis 1. Remember in Genesis 1, we see God creating and resting, creating and resting. It's a rhythmic ordering. Now God is praised for stretching out the heavens like a tent, it says, for establishing the foundation of the earth in verse 5 and covering it with the deep. And for rebuking the waters to flee to their appointed places so that they may not gain again cover the earth. And the moon. He describes the moon. The moon is made to mark the seasons and night and day and establish a natural rhythm for nocturnal creatures and for human beings. Now verse 24, which was our last verse, it reads or sings like this. 
um, elaboration on God's assertion of the goodness of created things, the multiplicity of creatures, and the wisdom with which they are actually made. Psalm 104 is really like the poetry of Genesis 1. It's set to music. It's singing this wondrous order that God has brought forth. And the musicality of the psalm is further enhanced by its emphasis on, on the interdependence of God's creatures. Springs that gush forth in valleys provide water for the wild animals. Vegetation is made to grow in order to supply food for cattle and human beings. And God not only made the trees, but made various trees as homes for all of these different kinds of birds. Mountains are created to provide homes for goats and rocks to provide homes for crags, mostly like the hyrax, which is like a small hooved animal. Everything that God has made exists for another creature. For that creature's survival. And even enjoyment. Birds, they sing among the branches of the trees that grow alongside the streams of water. This interdependence is the order that God has given to the world. So that each created thing sounds a note in this ongoing harmony. That creatures are made not only to survive, but also to enjoy life. And that underscores what is perhaps the central motif of the entire psalm, and particularly the passage for today, it's joy. God delights in the creation, and we delight in this world and in the God who made it. The world is made from joy, and it's made for joy. That gushing forth of springs and joy of birdsong in the trees alongside the abundantly watered trees of the Lord, the wine to gladden the human heart, the oil to make the face shine, and the bread to strengthen the human heart. These point to this world made, made not just for the satisfaction of need, but also for the happiness of the inhabitants. And in these works, God rejoices, and all the creatures return with joy not only by rejoicing God, but by delighting, delighting in the things that God has made. It's by understanding joy as the central theme in this text that we can understand the passage for today. Verse 24 operates as a summation of what has come before. God has praised for the multiple wonders of the earth, for the wisdom with which they were made. And the psalmist then turns to the sea and the inhabitants as the crowning example of the wonder of creation. Innumerable creatures inhabit the sea, living things both small and great. So we see God as this creator and as this sustainer. And it's stressed through the entire book of Psalms. In God's wisdom, God has created all, and we need to learn to turn to the animals who will teach us, the birds of the air who will tell us, the plants of the earth that will teach us, and the fish of the sea will remind us that the hand of the Lord has created us all, and that the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being are in God's hands. And, and although today's scripture does not include a gospel reading, reminders of God's care for all created things can be found in the gospels, in Matthew specifically, chapter 6 and chapter 10. Jesus is present with us in all of creation. But consider, too, the words of one of our favorite songs in the garden, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. This hymn expresses what so much of us experience when we are truly present in nature. We experience this resurrected Christ. And in this season of resurrection, there are signs of new life all around us. Trees beginning to flower 
baby birds in new nests. We found a little baby bunny in our backyard. J. Clinton McCann Jr. makes several valuable observations in his reflections on Psalm 104 in the New Interpreter's Bible. He notes that the origin and the destiny of humankind is inextricably tied to the origin and the destiny of the earth. And he reminds us that the etymology of the word human from the Latin humus, or soil, he notes that everything we do has an effect on God's world, and thus on God. He also makes several valuable observations about the importance of praising God as the beginning of environmental consciousness. Psalm 104 is a psalm of praise. The words, bless the Lord, O my soul, are found in verses 1 and verses 35 with the last words of praise the Lord. And although these verses are not included in today's reading, they are an important part of this psalm. McCann contrasts this praise-centered approach with an environmental consciousness born of fear in which our primary concern is always ourselves. And although many humans in our time think that nature is here to serve us, we are meant to serve God's creation. We live in this time in which our human arrogance and thinking ourselves able to save the world, interdependent of our creator, has resulted in devastating imbalances in the world that are most deeply and tragically experienced by creatures with no advocates and humans in our society do not have the resources to deal with the effects of climate change, limited and pure water sources, food deserts, and polluted air. And many of these changes are the result of human greed and a lack of understanding of the consequences, really, of our actions. So I ask you this week to reflect on your reactions to the news we hear every day about climate change loss of habitat, habitat or species extinction, and other often frightening stories. I think we feel overwhelmed sometimes and we lose hope, and along with that, the will to make the changes in our own lives that might lessen the bad effects of humans on our environment. Maybe some of you can relate to this. I remember when I was a kid, my parents, my dad worked for Pepsi for a while, and so when you well, at least then, when you worked for Pepsi, you got to bring home Pepsi. And um, I would go through and cut all of the rings that held the cans together to save the sea turtles. My mom thought it was the dumbest thing she'd ever heard <laughs> and was irritated that I left half these little ring things all over our house. I'm sure that translates to things we could be doing today. As a first step, what are some ways that we can find time to appreciate God's creation. This might include walks in natural settings, time in a garden, or, or time with a park naturalist, bird feeders, and native plantings that attract native species of insects, moths, or butterflies that really make us aware of the diversity of our local area. A reminder that the life of faith is about more than just coming to church on a Sunday, and that worship can truly happen anywhere, especially in a natural setting. Loving creation is a way of loving the author of creation and appreciating the good gifts that God has given to us. And loving creation can also motivate us to make changes to better care for our environment. I went on a mission trip with my girls to Colorado um, a while ago. I can't even remember when. Uh, we had the opportunity to worship at a closed retreat center. I don't know if you can see, that is um, an elk, I think, a moose, a moose. We sat and we sang and all of these animals started appearing around us, like out of Snow White or something. It was a wonderful way to sit and praise God. We went at dusk. Um, I'm not sure why we decided singing was a good idea, only because of the altitude, and we had to, like, walk way up into the woods. We had some people get sick, not naming names. Uh, there is joy at the foundation of earth. In the dew of the grass, 
and the romping of dogs in the quiet of a cricket on a summer night. Many kinds of butterflies and caterpillars, even the ones that, that bite and sting. There's joy in this wondrous interdependence of God's creatures and in the necessity in which we exist for one another. There's joy in the winning over of the chaos that continues to threaten God's harmonious creation. As a Christian community, we have the opportunity to come together and to praise God. This praise is really important for remembering that God asked us to be caretakers of this world. That there's joy in the gifts of life and spirit that we receive from God. And in our rejoicing in those gifts. For this joy, we offer God our joyous praise. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for the new creation. The new creation around us, the new creation in our nature. You envisioned and brought into being all of creation and humanity. Humanity is just one part of your incredible world, and we open our minds and our hearts to the delicacy and the interconnectedness of all that you have made. May your insight into God's wonder-filled creation grow. In your son's holy name, amen.
provides for the earth and for us, its inhabitants, and in so many incredible ways. And God's generosity breathes through every sunrise, through every sunset, every flower that blooms, every meal that nourishes our body. And as we become better listeners to the environment that surrounds us, may the Holy Spirit move us. Today we have an opportunity to respond to God's generosity on uh, our own by supporting the missions and the ministries of the church through giving our financial resources, our time, and also our energy. And today I want to highlight our homeless care kit uh, ministry. It is in need of some items, mainly um, the pop-top tuna or packaged tuna um, uh, fruit cups, and there was something else. I've already forgotten. I will be happy to talk to you about it after service. <laughs> but if you would like to give today to that ministry, we ask that you put your offering in the plate when you come forward for communion. There is no better place to experience God's creation than at the communion table. You have the opportunity to come and to feel God's grace. Grace that we don't deserve, grace that we've not earned, but grace that God gives us freely. Jesus took the bread, he held it up, and he broke it, and he said, take, eat, this is for you in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you in remembrance of a new covenant, take and drink. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here today and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood until he comes back in final victory, and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as our uh, communion stewards prepare themselves to serve communion, please know that this is an open table. You are welcome at this table. You do not have to be a member of this church. You do not have to be a United Methodist. You don't even have to believe everything that we believe. But if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are welcome here. Our ushers will release you from the back forward. You can put any offerings that you may have here in the plate. And we, we say that the, the prayer rails are open if you would like to use them. The table is open.
right after service if you want to go downstairs and grab some snacks and fellowship with people. Um, also, youth, I see a couple youth, uh, the lock-in registration is coming up for the Nerf Wars, so make sure that you get that turned in. In regards to that, we need any large boxes you may have and empty two-liter bottles. We're still looking for those. The men's breakfast has been pushed back a week, right, third, oh wait, you're here, third week, the third week, third Saturday, third Saturday on the 20th. Um, we also had Clardy Elementary reach out, they're doing map testing, I think some of you may have gotten a text about it from Beth, but they're doing map testing at the end of this month, they're not allowed to use food as incentives for map, map testing, so they've asked if we could donate $5 gift cards to local places like Casey's, Sonic, Target, uh, Quick Trip. So if you would like to do that, please bring those um, probably next week, probably next week, so we can get the, to them in time. And then the last thing is, um, I will be ordained in June at annual conference. Yes, very excited about that. Um, and part of my uh, ordination and, and those that are being ordained with me we get invited to go on a trip with the bishop. I'm not going to say anything else because this is online. Okay, so we get to go with the bishop. But part of that is we get to ask you if you would like to go with us. Um, so this trip, because the Holy Land is not an option this year, um, we're doing a Wesley Heritage Tour, October 15th through 24th. Um, I've already put my deposit down, so I'm going. If you would like to go with us, I'm going to set these out on the table, and you can pick one up. And um, if you have any questions about how to fill it out or whatever, just let me know. I think this will be a really cool trip to see um, where Wesley uh, did his ministry. So um, I'm going to set this out there for anybody who might be interested in going with me. I won't take it personally if you don't go. 
So friends, let me, let me get you out of here with our benediction this morning. You are a new creation. God comes in and gives us new creation every day. Not only are we caretakers of our world for new creation, we're caretakers of ourselves. So I hope you have a blessed week. Go in peace. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great the Lord! How great.